Always good to see the numbers keep going up. Um, everybody's coming in, welcome. Uh, welcome to your March hosted at home. Uh, we are definitely celebrating women and wine. Um, yeah, get settled in. Once everybody gets here, I'll give you all your instructions and we will get rocking and rolling, but thank you all for joining us. The weather in the background of my photo is not indicative of the actual weather we're having today. So if anybody is not in Napa, you're not missing much today, just as a heads up. Like you better to be doing the virtual tasting with us. <laughs> You're ready like 10, 15 more seconds to roll in. Um, what I will say with this one, since we are doing two Cabernets, I would highly recommend, if at all possible, having two glasses to be able to taste the Cabernets side by side. Just going to make it easier to compare contrast. All right, well, I mean, I think probably we can get, go ahead and get rocking and rolling. Um, anybody else that joins late, we'll get them caught up. Um, welcome everybody to your March hosted at home. My name is Todd Elliott. I am your host uh, extraordinaire from what I'm told. Um, and we are joined this month by Brooke Price, who is our head winemaker for Bella Union as we are celebrating women in wine. And she is a phenomenal winemaker. And we're gonna get to know Brooke, a little bit, learn a little bit more about her, a little bit more about Bella Union. We're gonna have a great time. Um, for those of you that might not have been on a hosted at home previously, there are a few different ways for you to interact. This is interactive, so we want your questions. Um, if you look down at the bottom, you have a little section called Q&A. Please feel free if you have any questions that you would like to get immediately answered, pop them into the Q&A. I will try to answer them live. The chat section, shockingly enough, is just a chat. We want you guys to interact. Talk about the wines. Where are you all from? What are you doing? What are you serving to eat with the wine? Like. That's for you all to kind of get to know each other a little bit more. And then at the end, if you have any questions that are pressing and you need them to get answered, put them in the Q&A. But if you can, hold your water. And at the end of this bad boy, we are going to promote everybody to panelists and you can ask your questions live on camera. Um, we're going to start with the Bella Union Sauvignon Blanc. And then we are going to do the Bella Union Napa Valley Cabernet and the Nickel and Nickel Quicksilver Cabernet. For those of you that didn't hear, if you have two glasses, we'll talk about them individually, but let's try to do them side by side. Um, I'm going to encourage everybody, if you haven't already, to go ahead and get a little bit of the 2021 Bella Union Sauvignon Blanc into the glass. And I am about to be joined by Brooke Price, who is our head winemaker for Bella Union. So uh, let's get rocking and rolling. How's it going, Brooke? It's good, Todd. It's um, a nice, rainy, kind of cozy day today. How are you doing today? I'm good. I mean, I, it's so funny that like, I feel like I only get to see you on Zoom. You know what I mean? Because you're so yeah. busy and I'm so far, like, it, I enjoy getting to catch up with you as much on these as I hope everybody else does. So uh, thank you very much for taking time out of the day to come join us. Um, so first things first, um, how's everything going in the vineyards? Like, I mean, have we had any bud break? Because this, this weather is super neat. So how are we rolling into 2023? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, we're like off to a great start. We are getting a lot of rain. It's raining right now. Um, it's just really nice to to have this, you know, nice change in weather. Um, we even got some snow uh, last week in some of the higher elevations in Napa Valley on both ranges, both on the east and the west, um, on the along the Vaca the Vaca range as well as the Mayacamas. And um, it was it was pretty special at our new winery lo location, our new home. Uh, you could even catch a glimpse of Mount St. Helena, which was snow capped and it was beautiful, a very unusual sight to see, um, very rare. And uh, bud break has not started yet, so um, and not in any of your in any of our vineyards. Uh, but if anything, kind of this like colder weather might push some things back. Um, at this point. So yeah, I mean, we're gearing up for an interesting growing season. We're welcoming all the rain and it's great to see. It's great. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, it can't be mad. I mean, you know what I mean? Five years ago, if somebody had said, hey, don't worry, in 2023, you're gonna get plenty of rain, we'd have been happy to hear it. It's just, you know, exactly. when you're in the mix, it's like, well, this is a little damp. Um, so <laughs> let's, 
let's get to know Brooke. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, where are you originally from? Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Like, tell us a little bit about what got you to us. Yeah, so um, I am from San Diego originally, born and raised in San Diego. So I grew up um, going to the beach quite often, going surfing. I just loved being in the outdoors and with, in nature. Uh, and I ended up going up north to UC Davis, uh, which for me was quite the transition, <laughs> going from a beach town to a complete ag town. Looked yeah. around and not a single beach in sight. So <laughs> it's quite the transition. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a it was a great uh, great program uh, and had a great time. I now, did you it. choose UC Davis specifically because you've known that you wanted to pursue winemaking, or did you just like, hey, UC Davis is a great school, and then when you got there, it kind of awoke in your passion? Like, have you always been focused on getting into wine, or what kind of flipped your switch? Yeah, so I went to Davis originally not for winemaking. Um, it went primarily because it was a great school, great UC school. Uh, I thought that I went in knowing that I was going to get some sort of like science degree, some, you know, a, a BS in something. And I hadn't quite figured it out exactly at that point when I was like a freshman what that was going to be. Um, but then after my freshman year, I decided to do a quarter abroad um, where I studied in Burgundy at the University of Dijon. And that's where I took my very first winemaking class, um, which was incredible. I mean, we learned about like wine sensory and then the basic principles and practices of, of winemaking. And then at that point, I kind of became fascinated with like the whole process and we learned winemaking really from from start to finish right. um, and when I got back uh, from that trip I decided to pursue viticulture enology change my major okay. um, and, and get a degree in viticulture enology and then I mean I have to say a lot of it really came up to good luck and timing because I just happened to be attending you know one of the best schools for viticulture and enology right, so right, I, right right that's what you know what I mean yeah. like a lot of people at Davis I mean like it, it, it is known for that program so I just you know it, it, you were in yeah. the right place for sure <laughs> right place right time um yeah and then uh like loved it loved everything about it it just like really like taking more classes like solidified um you know everything that i was super excited about like you know the whole process of learning about like the science and kind of the engineering of winemaking and um you know while i was there i um like during my studies, I did an internship at Domaine Chandon in California and in Napa and, um, you know, got some experience as an intern. And it also solidified that, like, you know, I was on the right track um, That's awesome. before I graduated. So it's, yeah, it's really it's, great it's to great. know, like when you when you get that feeling, you're like, you know what, I'm in the right place. I'm doing the right thing, you know? Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. I mean, because it takes it takes time, you know, and when you go to college, you're pretty young and you know, you want to figure out like what you're doing. So and coming um, from the guy, yeah. like I switched majors like four times. I totally get it. Like, it's not <laughs> like, you know, like I want to do something, you know? So, I mean, exactly. I will say selfishly and as a company, we are pretty psyched that you decided to go down the winemaking path. So thank you. Um, <laughs> so just since graduation, what brought you to Bella Union to Farniente family of wineries? Like what is, your winemaking background since you graduated? Yeah, so um, my, my background and kind of my path to being where I am today, it's been quite a journey. I, I do have to say it's been very exciting. Um, and like when I first, starting out with when I first graduated, um, like the summer after I graduated, um, and, and really just for the first two years or so, um, I spent uh, two internships abroad, one of them being in Tuscany at this little family-owned winery called Tenuta del Baggiano, which was just outside of Lucca, and um, as well as like New Zealand in the North Island in the Hawke's Bay growing region at this place called Church Road Winery. 
Um, and yeah, so I worked in the vineyards, the cellar and the lab where I got like my first real taste of like what goes into making wine. And let's just say I spent a lot of time cleaning and sanitizing tanks and winery equipment. A lot of tanks, a lot of hoses, right? A like, lot yeah. of tanks, a lot of hoses. Yeah, just like really kind of getting down and um, yeah, just a lot of really hard work. And, you know, it was, it was really tough um, at some points, I will have to say, but I'm super glad that I did it because it was just so rewarding and so rewarding to be a part of that team and um, just, Plus, I mean, spending time in these beautiful regions, it's just, it's not so bad. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So. Right. Like you're talking about, yeah. Oh, I know this. Where were you? Um, kind of the most gorgeous places on earth, but don't worry about that right now. <laughs> exactly. Right. I know. It's like really, like truly now, even to this day, like when I try to think of like travels or where I want to go, um, they all happen to be wine regions because they are the most beautiful regions like in the world, arguably. Sure. So, sure. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so then I got my, after, you know, doing a little bit of travel, I got my first real full-time job in the industry working at Jordan, uh, family winery in, in Sonoma. And so I started as an intern, like as an intern there, and then later got promoted as a, like a full-time uh, lab technician. And then after working with Jordan, um, I moved from the Sonoma Valley over the Mayakama Range and over to Napa Valley. So that's where I first started working at Stag's Leap Winery. Um, I worked there um, as well as Pine Ridge um, and Hall, uh, all before landing with the Farniente family. So um, yeah, and then I mean, it's some of the highlights, you know what I mean? Like, I, yeah, I, you're like the, as you're listing off winery names, I'm like, don't drool on camera, don't drool. On camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, we're really glad that you eventually made your way over to us. Um, by the way, for those of you that have not already started sipping the Bella Union Sauvignon Blanc, um, I, I very much encourage you to do that. You should have been doing that already, so it's time to catch up. Um, but Brooke, I feel like you talking about having been in New Zealand is kind of a fun transition to Sauvignon Blanc anyway. Um, this is the first Sauvignon Blanc we produced. I am pretty sure this is the first white wine that our family of wineries produced that was not Chardonnay. So tell us a little bit about like how the Sauvignon Blanc came to be. Where do we grow this grapes? Like what, how did we end up making an SB? Yeah, that's that's correct. That's pretty exciting. The first SB in in our family's pro yep. portfolio. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm super excited about it. This is the 2021 Sauvignon Blanc that we're drinking. It is Rutherford Appellated, uh, primarily coming from uh, two estate vineyards that we have, one of them being the Bella Union estate surrounding the winery itself as well as our other vineyard property, which backs up right against the Bella Union property, the DeCarly Vineyard. Right. So, um, so yeah, the, the Sauvignon Blanc is the first thing that is, that is harvested for us during harvest. It's usually brought into the winery like anywhere between uh, mid to late August with the estate vineyard being the first one um, to be picked followed by uh, the Tacarly. There's usually like a one or two week difference there in, in maturity. Um, and with those two vineyards, we're getting like uh, added complexity and layers that bring a lot of interest to this wine. So from the Bell Union Estate, uh, you get a lot of citrus driven fruit, um, you know, some, some Meyer lemon, some grapefruit, and some really nice minerality and freshness, really good acidity. And then from the DeCarly Vineyard, um, and you can taste this, you know, in the grapes as they're coming into just like really great flavors, some really good stone fruit, um, some nice like layered complexity and some tropical fruit as well. So together, it just kind of really, uh, they play really well together in making a super well-balanced uh, fruit, um, you know, complex, driven uh, Sauvignon Blanc that's just like super light and refreshing um, and, you know, pairs so well with so many different kinds of food. Oh, for um, sure. Especially in the summer, like all those like kind of light, I mean, just, is that what you're looking for when you are tasting the Sauvignon Blanc? Is that what you're looking for? Like you, you want crisp, you want refreshing, you want that nice stone fruit. Like is it, it, when you sit down and you're tasting, what, what are you like? Yes, I've done it. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really want, like, I wanted to speak to, um, you know, the, the vineyard and the, the site that it came from and really make, like, really showcase, like, what, what the vineyard really does have to offer. And it's exactly what you listed, right? So, um, a wine that has like acidity, but like some good like mouthfeel and texture as well. Um, so it, you know, it is it's linear, but it's not just linear. It also has like some some nice texture. And I think that when you know we've played around with a lot of fermentation vessels, when we put the Sauvignon Blanc into uh, you know neutral oak, uh, which you know obviously it won't impart any oak flavors, but like you get the complexity and some texture just from the shape of having it ferment in barrels, as well as concrete. Um, we have a few concrete eggs that we use, um, which I think helps with the, the texture and the roundness too. So um, yeah, I mean, those two components together, like really just like add to making a really great, crisp, refreshing Sauvignon Blanc, like you said. Um, well, um, so. I'm going to have you give everybody kind of your like, you know, pro tasting notes. But one thing I've always been curious about, because like with white wine, like people never talk about aging, obviously, you know, you buy white wine to go drink it that day on the porch, right? But like one thing that I know is like acidity is normally a pretty good indicator of the fact that a wine can be aged. Now I know obviously people aren't buying Sauvignon Blanc specifically to age it, but since everybody's obviously gonna love this wine and buy a case, if they lay it down, like what do you think the shelf life is on this? Like how long could you go? Like if somebody finds a bottle of this in four or five years that they forgot to take out of their wine fridge, are we still cool? Yeah, that's a great question. And like the wine definitely, like if you do leave it in your cell, you find it like three, four years later. I mean, it certainly will. I would expect it to change in complexity uh, over time as it, as it ages. Right. Um, and at the same time, if you do want to drink it right away, it's ready. So like, it's good right now, and I'm happy to drink it through the rest of the summer as well. Um, yeah, it's it's gonna like the like you said, the acidity it definitely like helps it age over time, and like the acidity will definitely be there. And while um, the aromas will probably go from like more citrus to more like um, like a little bit more like phenolic, a little bit more um, like stone fruit, kind of more like ripe fruit, like that kind of characteristic with time. So, yeah. Well, um, I'll tell you what, if you want to uh, maybe give us your tasting notes. And then one thing, one question we always get with all of our wines, because all of our host at home members enjoy good food to go with good wine. Have you found any fun pairings for this one where like as you're drinking the S, you're like, man, this goes really well with this. So give us your tasting notes and then double down with a little bit of food. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, so, I mean, super refreshing. Like I said, like, really nice, um, really nice stone fruit, some really good minerality as well. Freshness on the palate. Um, it's, yeah, we've got some, like, uh, Meyer lemon zest, a little bit of like key lime pie, that kind of thing going I was on. Literally and, just gonna say, okay, that I get. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What are What are you getting, Todd? Yeah. So, All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, it's so inviting. You know, it has that like acidity where it's just, it's that mouth watering acidity. It leaves you wanting to get that that next sip, right? Odd question. Just while it's on my head, I feel like I need to put this in the Q and A. Because when we did the deep dive with Greg on Dolce, he talked about like key lime pie flavors. And I know that we use some Sauvignon Blanc in the Dolce. Is he sourcing his grapes from the same blocks that you're using for this SB or is it a completely different area? I'm just curious. That's a good question. Um, we don't share the same vineyards for okay. Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, so we have completely different vineyards, um, but I I could see that being um, like probably the reason why he like like we are, seeing some key lime, lime like that kind of Those citrus kind of, or characteristic it's like, it's from that the brightness SP. and that citrusiness but like that kind of almost like caramelized back end where it's got a little bit of a little hint of sweetness you know like i wouldn't describe yeah. pie as sweet necessarily but it's a dessert so it's got you know like i 
I was just curious. I was like, that's, I've heard that before. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's really, that's, um, that's so true. Cause like I do, I was even trying, um, so, so we're, uh, we're bottling the 2022 vintage SB in a week here. And so I was tasting it with, um, with, you know, our team and everything. And we were talking about how it has like throughout the years, it's that inviting aromatic where it has like that perception of sweetness, but it's completely bone dry. Like there's no sweetness, like sweetness at all, but it does have that like key lime pie characteristic to it. Like you're saying like lemon meringue. Um, and it's just like very, very inviting. And yes. um, that acidity is just so nice because I feel like it does really kind of play into some dishes that have a little bit more richness in it you know like if you're going for some sort of like pasta alfredo or some sort of I'm like literally gonna say it goes really well with carbonara this time Ooh, right yes <laughs> exactly like cheesy pasta dishes like I, I could also see some sort of like lemon ricotta um you know filled ravioli or something like, like that even or something like that like yeah yeah exactly um because i just feel like it goes with that to kind of like cut into the richness, but also um, I like it because it could like lift the flavors in delicate dishes too. If you're leaning more towards like a seafood or lighter meat, it won't compete against like the delicate nature of like those dishes as well. They're so. gonna hold hands well instead of trying to trump each other constantly. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, all right, well, we're going to start to transition. Once again, for those of you that maybe didn't hear it, if you have two glasses to do the Cabernet side by side, very much encourage you to do that. We're going to talk about them individually, but that way you can kind of go back and forth because bottom line, I feel like 2017 uh, Belly Union Napa Valley Cab and 2018 Nickel and Nickel Quicksilver Cab, the only thing that those two wines have in common is the word Cabernet and the word Sauvignon, really, you know. So I want people to be able to do them side by side, but we're gonna talk about them individually. Uh, but Brooke, before we get into the Bella Union Napa Valley Cab specifically, Bella Union is a newer project for us. What would you consider like the mission statement for Bella? Like when you walk into the winery every day, what are you trying to do? Yeah, that's it. I mean, number one answer, like the number one short, concise answer to that question is like truly make the best quality wines that we can make, right? So that's like my number one mission um, as, well, you're as a winemaker. So well played. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, just kind of like going back into like Bella Union, where it started, where we come from, I mean, uh back in 2012 that was like the very first vintage that bella union had and so at that point we were only making one wine which is still our flagship wine the napa the napa valley cabernet sauvignon um, blend and while it is a cabernet blend it does encompass all five bordeaux traditional varieties it has merlot malbec cap franc and petit verdot as well um and so we at bella union we've been you know for the past 10 plus years we've made it our focus to like highlight the potential blending of these um these varietals and um kind of just like what uh, crafting a wine that really expresses what what you can make a balanced wine um from grapes uh from that are grown in different parts of napa valley you know from as north of Calistoga down south to you know Yonville, Oak Knoll, um, as you go down south of, of Napa, uh, different different climates, different microclimates, uh, they contribute so many different great things. You know, you have like your rich, ripe flavors from the hotter climates of Calistoga to like the nice cool kind of uh, red fruit driven uh, aromatically driven fruit from like the south where it's a little bit cooler so yeah just like really playing into um putting together these different blends and there's you know a lot of a lot of fun things that happen with that too you think that's kind of how bella fits into the family you know what i mean because like we've got six wineries in our family four of them are making cabernets like is that kind of where bella fits it's just the one where you can do a little bit of blending like do you have a little bit more autonomy to play around a little bit, I guess? 
Yeah, no, that's so true. Yeah, you you definitely, yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's really focusing on like the art of the blend and like taking different components and uh, blending them into a single wine. And uh, we get to kind of like, I get to lean in on sort of my creative side and play around and like think about things in a different way of like how things might come together if we change the proportion of one vineyard source, you know, to another, or maybe we'll put in a little bit more low um, to kind of soften out the, you know, because Cabernet Sauvignon as it is, is usually pretty tannic in nature. And if you want to like, like tone that down a little bit, what, what happens if you add a little bit more low and, um, you know, maybe I want some nice like peppery spice component. I'll pulse in a little bit of Cap Franc. So um, yeah, just like really getting to know like what um, every component might do uh, or what it might contribute. And then that's one thing. And then seeing it all kind of come together as one uh, is also very interesting as well. So. Well, as somebody that loves your Cab Franc, which by the way, everybody, 2019 Belle Union Cabernet Franc, get it while it's here. Um, please don't pull too much of the Cab Franc into the blend because I need it for the, the actual Cab Franc. I mean, I get what you're saying, but so, <laughs> keep that bad boy around. Um, so before we get into the Napa Valley blend, uh, Bella Union's got some stuff popping. Like we're, it is probably, in all honesty, like our most exciting brand right now. So can we talk a little bit about what's going on um, and visual aid department, if you might want to help us out here? Yes, um, we have some really exciting things going on. Namely, those are our plans for our new, our new home. Um, so if you're looking at it um, right now as it stands, so the, the building has changed color and then uh, coming off of that uh, kind of rectangle build, like shaped building in the front with all the trees and whatnot, you'll see if you look really closely, there's a glass, uh, we call it like the glass jewel box, which is a structure that's gonna be a two story structure that will uh, come off of the existing wall an additional 20 feet out. Um, and that's where we'll hold some, you know, nice exclusive tastings. Um, I cannot wait to, yeah. for all I'm of so this to happen, to right? It's so <laughs> exciting, it's so like just, Unreal, it's it's so fun. Uh, this is all gonna happen. Um, doors will open in June of 2024. Uh, and then you'll notice as well, some really nice landscaping, um, lots of trees, uh, some garden areas where um, we'll invite guests to, uh, you know, picnic, sit outside, um, go uh, you know under some covered spaces so really like an experience for everyone to enjoy like all year round so um it, it'll truly be very exciting i, I i'm so psyched like i mean it, it's gonna be a lot of fun yes. I, I i'm just really excited by the way everybody on the call that just means like um i might have heard the phrase june of 2024 thrown around a few times so um, June of 2024, team, let's all come out and visit Brook at Bellevue yes. and get down on some of the amazing wine she's making. Um, so we talked about Bella Union, right? You get a little autonomy, you get to play around. I can see that being a little column A, little column B, where it's a lot of fun. Like you said, you get to unlock your creative side, but there's so much good fruit in the valley and there's so many varietals and there's just infinite possibilities. When you're going out and looking for a new vineyard to source fruit from, or you're looking for a new varietal, or you're trying to play around, what do you look for when you're like looking to make a new wine, source a new vineyard? Like when you get to be like, hey, Brooke, you pick this one. What are you looking for? Yeah, that's a great question, right? Because uh, I mean, I think we're so lucky just like as a company to have so much intel on the wine, like in the wine industry, just in Napa alone, right? Um, being really like stewards of the land for a, a multiple different sites, like all throughout the valley, right? So we have that to our advantage is just like the vast amount of knowledge and the history, right, of each of these sites. Because uh, every almost like every vineyard that I've worked with has like a unique uh, historical um, 
like story and and like where it came from or maybe who uh where who used the fruit or who owned the site and um you know it's so much i feel like i'm still learning about all there's so much to learn about all the different uh vineyards themselves um if you're not learning something about wine every day in the industry you're just not trying like there's so much <laughs> it's so true yeah <laughs> yeah it's so true i mean like just like learning about like the different microclimates the soil profile like everything it's um you know like what would be the best or most advantageous way to farm that specific site um how uh you know wh what direction am i getting my afternoon sun my morning sun and um are we going to like uh, you know, trellis or treat our vines in a, a different way to adhere to that. And so, yeah, like you said, I mean, you're always on your toes, just like thinking about all these, um, you know, things, these details that go into um, really crafting and highlighting um, each vineyard um, and every, you know, the quality of fruit that each vineyard can produce, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, Napa, Napa Valley just is obviously just known as being an exceptional location for Cabernet Sauvignon and you know it's um, it's relatives and you know all the traditional Bordeaux varieties so I mean that in itself is is great um, and then I mean I will I will say that in so we just completed our 2022 harvest and I'm tasting and evaluating like all of our vineyards and sites that, um, you know, that we made. And um, I put together with my team and finalized three new uh, red blends that um, I, I will say, I won't go into what they are yet, but I will okay. say that they are very, very exciting. Um, and they are yeah there's gonna be three new red blends so those will those won't get bottled until spring of 2024 um but they will be offered at our winery when it opens so we have some really exciting like things coming like with the program um we're also going to start making um two more white blends as well so um yeah just really I know, exciting things keep your, keep your ears open check your emails like <laughs> a lot of exciting stuff coming in which is super, yeah like I, yeah um so of, let's yeah. talk about this wine specifically 2017 belly union napa valley cabernet you mentioned obviously that this is a blended wine what do you know the breakdown on this one as opposed to like cabernet sauvignon and all the other bits and pieces do you know what the composition is on this one just, I mean, I know I'm asking you to remember the composition of a wine five years ago. But. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I can tell you that this, um, I have to look into my notes to tell you the exact breakdown, but 2017, um, I was, so I started working with um, Bell Union in 2018. So I actually helped facilitate this and bring this into bottle, um, brought it out of barrel, I was there, you know, um, as assistant winemaker, my role was to um, really facilitate uh, quality and uh, making sure that everything that was supposed to happen happened and brought that like uh, watching it age in barrel, brought it to tank, helped blend it. Um, and it's it is primarily um, Cabernet Sauvignon. I won't, I want to say it's uh, anywhere between like like 84, 85 percent cab um, and then um, the and then followed by like Merlot and then 10 or so uh 10 percent or so of Merlot and just a little bit little tiny little doses of uh Cab Franc um Petit Verdot and Malbec so um and the and that is a good question right because the blend does vary from year to year um and yeah this is um and that's what I was gonna say just really quick before we get into this specific one that's a question I have because Belly Union, like you are blending, right? I know, for example, like Nicole strives for like consistency in the Farniente Cabernet. She wants it to, to taste as similar as possible from year to year, right? Are you more focused on making Bella Union like Bella Union, or do you okay with a little bit of 
variety in flavor profile as long as you're just making the best possible wine? Yeah, I mean, I would say like a little bit of both, right? Like okay. we do, we do value consistency in like taste and quality. Um, and I would say at Bell Union, like our biggest priority above above all is really making the best wine that that particular vintage has to offer, right? Um, and making the best wine that we can. So like. Um, being that it's mother nature right we every year is completely different um with its own like unique set of challenges you know um there are different like characteristics and kind of opportunities every single vineyard that like so it's i see it as like our job to kind of adapt and highlight those like best attributes that um the grape and mother nature and everything really gives you to really highlight those those components and make the best best blend and the best wines possible from from those sources that's i just you know what i mean like it's just it's always kind of nice to know like we obviously want our wine to have a familiar flavor profile right like you want people when they drink it to be like oh well, that's belly union but i just yes. wasn't sure like if you had one that you tried to weigh to the side or the other um so the 2017 uh you already had your nose in there but give us your pro opinion i want to hear what what you're thinking <laughs> and how this is drinking because i mean i normally put a little bit of age on my cab but with this being a blended cab i mean this is drinking super nice right now personal opinion yeah i um i haven't visited the 2017 in a while and it's and it's lovely it's it's been you know one of my one of my favorite vintages too, um, but just right off the nose, I'm getting like this really beautiful, like uh, spice component, a little bit of like leather, uh, tobacco, um, but all, yeah, just like <clears throat> over time, this wine is really, it's it's been cool to check in on it every now and then, right? Like um, throughout it's like bottling age and development, right? Um, but the the wine itself is just like super inky in color, um, texture and flavor. It's just so like layered and fresh. And I have like some really nice, beautiful um, like concentration and and depth and flavor of of fruit. Both the uh, some some nice like cassis and blackberry spice, some jam. The mouthfeel is very like soft and elegant, smooth, just like that was, uh, smooth is the first word I throw out about this. Yeah, like, it, just, it it doesn't disappear. Like I like that it's got a nice roundness. It hits all corners of your palate, but it just it it goes down. You, you're getting different flavor profiles on every part of your tongue, but then it just like you're like, cool, I want more of that. I don't know. Like, I don't know what better. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like if you were to describe it like a like a texture, it's very, it's just very like it's just silky, like it's just super smooth and like kind of just coating and round and. Uh. Well, I just I always tell people with this Belly Union, it's like I'm a cab drinker, and this is the one I keep at home because like sometimes I just want a glass of Cabernet at the end of the night, and I don't feel like making a whole brisket. You know what I mean? Like I just want something yeah. a Cabernet that all you need is a glass in your face, and I really think mm -hmm. that this is one of those for sure. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's, um, I mean, it's just so like, people ask me all the time food pairing with this specific Cabernet. And I just feel like it's so much more versatile than like, um, like your really big, robust Cabernet, where it is, you know, chock full of tannins. It's like, it can go with so many things. Somebody said lamb, totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful pairing. Um, and like, even like, even if you're a vegetarian and like you don't want to have meat, like it will go with so many nice, like kind of hearty uh, vegetable dishes, something with like mushroom, like crispy mushroom, like a that kind of mushroom thing. Mushroom sandwich, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just like so versatile. Any kind of meat, like dark, you know, red meats to lighter meats. Um, oh, mushroom risotto. That sounds no, so good too. I'm coming in with lamb and mushroom risotto, and I have completely <sighs> lost my train of thought because now I just want lamb and mushroom risotto. Now I'm just getting some dinner ideas. This is great. Keep them coming. Yeah, Gary, like filet. Filet goes with everything, bro. Like yeah. Gary's one of my favorite people, and he—I mean, the man knows good food, but like filet goes with everything. Come on, like, 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, so it's funny, you just kind of mentioned um, those big, bold Cabernets. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the 2018 Nickel and Nickel Quicksilver. Um, so I'm actually kind of excited because most of the time when we do these hosted at homes, we try to give a good variety when we're ready to try everything in our portfolio. But we end up having one of our winemakers talk about a wine that they didn't have their hands in. And you had your hand in all three of these wines, right? Like the four belly and what were you doing? Yeah, it's pretty exciting. So um, before I was in my current role at Bella Union, I was actually the assistant winemaker for Nickel and Nickel. So I worked with Joe Harden for a um, little over two years as his assistant winemaker. And um, I mean, it was such a fun opportunity. I learned so much about single vineyard winemaking, which is pretty much polar opposite to what I'm doing at Bell Union right now. We'll um, but, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, it's just, it's so fascinating and like working with, um, you know, all these different excellent single vineyards uh, within the nickel and nickel portfolio, um, doing what you can um, as a winemaking team to highlight and express um, that single particular vineyard without having any blending ability at all. Um, so it's really, um, it's, I mean, Joe says this, it's his words. He says it's very high stakes winemaking. You get one shot at it. Yep. And um, I mean, you really have to be like quite on top of it. And really, I think a key part about it is really knowing your vineyards very well and knowing exactly what to do to shepherd those vineyards from vineyard to bottle and and make like a really beautifully crafted wine right so um so yeah i mean the the cool thing about this uh this vineyard is this let's see so i was so i joined nickel and nickel in 2019 so I was actually, so in 2018, I was assistant winemaker at Bella Union. Um, but when, but this particular wine, I actually did take the lead on getting this wine into bottle. Nice. So um, yeah, it was my job there to just like oversee quality and essentially, again, like babysit this wine, checking it on a daily basis. Um, we do monthly uh, QC tasting, uh, topping, rackings, and just like helping it bring bring it up to tank and um, you know bring it to bottle uh, bring it to bottle. So um, you know a lot of a lot of people say that they don't really like bottling because yes it's a little bit stressful because there are so many different like things you have to remember. But I truly love bottling uh, because it's just like the final step um, in the process before we get to bottle it all up and share it with everyone so it's kind of like a, coming from a restaurant background like you've got all the food made but when you plate it so that it looks extra delicious you're like there we go we got it exactly you know? exactly um, so just really quick because i want to talk about the difference between the wines i want the difference between the wine making strategies but let's start from the ground floor difference in the grapes because bella union based in rutherford nickel and nickel quicksilver rutherford what are some differences, though, in the vineyards? Rutherford's a big area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rutherford is a big area, right? Um, the so with uh, the different sites that we're sourcing uh, for the you know Bella Union blend, we have some Rutherford sites um, along the western bench of Rutherford, as well as the more eastern side towards uh, Silverado Trail and whatnot. And so this particular um, particular wine, Quicksilver, is located on the west side of okay. Rutherford. So if you're going up Highway 29 um, on Bell Oaks Lane there, uh, that is where the Quicksilver Vineyard is located. And it's a, it's a gorgeous site. Um, you have, yeah, you have mainly Cabernet Sauvignon planted there and for it this uh, particular wine. Obviously, it's 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, and it comes from, um, you know, one one vineyard and multiple blocks within that vineyard, some being like newer vines, some being older vines as well. Um, and it's, uh, 
I mean, it's really showing quite nicely right now. Yeah, that's uh. So tell you what, give give us kind of your tasting notes on this, and then if you can, little compare contrast with the Bella. Like, what are you seeing? Like, what what's different? What's similar? I'm asking the pro here. You know. <laughs> I um this this wine has like such nice finesse to it. It's uh it's very polished. Um it has like some nice like firm structure and tannins too. Um I I'm finding that like the oak is really well integrated as well. And nickel and nickel um usually it's like uh usually Joe likes to use uh, about like 50% new oak and the other um being you know neutral oak right so really highlighting the fruit um around 15 to 18 months of aging on its oak as well and um yeah i mean the, this site this rutherford site it's just there's a common thread in rutherford where it has like this really beautiful elegance to it it's not necessarily known as being like a an ava that has like lots of structure and like uh i, I guess the word i'm looking for is like power you know Punch. it's more okay. yeah it's more yeah exactly like it has it's more like lush um has like nice finesse and this particular wine is like very um the aromatics are like super like lifted there's a little bit of i'm getting a mix of both red fruit and dark fruit as well um and yeah just like some really nice like earthiness yeah i love the fruit notes exactly the fruit the notes are so great wine, honestly i think it's got a phenomenal nose to it too like it, yeah like it just a little bit of smoke like a little bit of fruit like it just it's really I, I, the, the word i use to describe quicksilver all the time is interesting which feels like a cop out mm -hmm. but it really is like it's got different corners of your mouth pick up different things. I just, I don't know. Like I've it's really, I, I've enjoyed tasting it while we were doing this, you know, like perks of the job. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> perks of the job. Hey, Logan, what'd you do today? Oh, well, you know, I had to taste through all of our wines, you know, like yeah. rough day at the office, right? Like, <laughs> Another day, somebody has to do it, right? Right, Todd? I'm willing to take that on. Let me, hold on, let me grab my cross to bear, you know? <laughs> So okay, if you're like these two compare contrast though, like if somebody was like, hey, we're going to do a side by side for our friends of like Bella Union Napa Valley Blend and Quicksilver. What would you say like and they were coming to you for guidance, like what, what would you say to look for? How would you say they're similar, different? Like what, what would you say to somebody that was planning on tasting them side by side? And you had never tried it before. Yeah, no, never that's, tried it before. That's a great question. So, um, yeah, I mean, the if you're looking for something that um, is like you know a pure expression of a of a single site, just kind of encapsulating that like one particular part of Rutherford, um, which a lot of people talk about, like the Rutherford dust, um, which which is a fun term that Andre Telchev coined back in the day. Um, it it does it encompasses that like nice um like dusty for me i get like this um kind of like uh pencil shaving um like in a really like nice way kind of cedar um note uh to it some um yeah like and there's also some like just like we were saying like beautiful just like highlighted fruit notes whereas the um i mean they, they are different vintages right so the 2017 bella um i'm getting a little bit more um, it's just like, it's nice to, it really is nice. Cause I mean, it's so hard to like compare them because they're so different. I know, they're right? so, yeah. <laughs> they're so what different. What would you say is different? Um, everything. Proceed. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, again, the nose is also like, it is, is very like lifted and, um, and fresh and everything. Um, but I'm getting like, uh, you know, with, with the the older vintage of the Bella Union, I'm getting more um, like kind of like like suppleness, um, like it's kind of um, um, like brooding. It's it's juicy. It's okay. uh, it's like soft um, and and elegant. Everything round, yeah, round as well. Um, so 
I would say like if you're looking at it from a perspective of like if more structure um, and more um, firm tannins, um, something that's going to, I could see nickel and nickel um, laying down and having a lot of aging potential, right? Um, like this young, this wine is so young right now and can be like enjoyed now. Um, you know, if, if you like, to, I personally really do enjoy young wines, but I, there is something so like awesome and beautiful about, um, you know, laying, laying down a wine and like having it in 10, 15, 20 years and mm -hmm. seeing like how it develops over time and how these tannins, um, how even though they're a little bit firm now, they'll really hold up well over time. Um, they'll mellow out. Um, and that's why we I recommend mean, everybody picking up a case and just drinking a bottle yeah, of beer. So you can see that, exactly. right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's so cool to just like see, like exactly get a case and like check in on it every now and then and um, see how the flavors really do develop over time because um, yeah, I mean, it'll really only get better with age, so. Well, um, it's great. last question from me before we open it up to the peanut gallery. Um, it's supposed to be two questions, but I'm not going to allow you to. We're going to do it all in one because, like, the question was, like, where do you see yourself and where do you see Bella Union? But you're not going anywhere. So um, where do you see yourself taking Bella Union in the next five years? Like, what we've got this gorgeous new space. You've got this autonomy to play around with some new – like, what, what would your – dream be for the next five years and where you can take this place and what you can do yeah i mean i can't wait to see where bell union does go in the next five years right because there's so many exciting things to come and i feel like we're really only getting started with like our brand new location right so um i can't wait to just continue to make the great wines that we're making um to launch this this hospitality space um, at our new home and really just like build and expand our portfolio of delicious wines. Um, I had a little bit of a teaser with the new wines that are about to come. Um, and I think that's like, you know, really the start. Like, um, I, I mean, I guess I can say that these, the, the wines that I have uh, blended that are gonna continue to age in barrel until they get bottled in a couple of years from now, um, they are, um, Bordeaux um, varieties, right? A blend of, of different Bordeaux varieties and different proportions. Um, but who knows? Yeah, maybe we'll branch out and start to do other French varieties. So I like um, the thought, you know. I mean, I'll yeah. be there. You let me know. I'm here to help. I'm here to support. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I, yeah, it's it's gonna be, it's it's such a great opportunity and like really like. Um, like just being part of the whole like Farniente portfolio it's like we're this is such a like a great space to be in right with like the uh you know the legacy of the Farniente uh, family and, and winery um and then you know just seeing how far um we've come since we've started right and I feel like Bell Union's story is just is just really starting so and it's really cool exciting. And exciting that you get to kind of write the history. I'm excited to see where you take it. Um, so we've promoted everybody to panelists. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question, except for uh, Corrine, until he pops that Michigan hat off, ain't nobody asking a question. O H I O. <laughs> but no, if anybody has a question for Brooke, or God forbid you've had enough to drink, do you have a question for me? Here's your time. Unmute, come on in. Bueller, Bueller, <laughs> something D O O economics. No. <laughs> hey, Gary, come on, help me out. That crew's got to have one question. So, you know, like, come on. We're... I mean, it might just be that everybody loved the wine too much, or we did just such an amazing, thorough job. Yeah. That, you know, like, I'm not mad. There we go. I saw <laughs> Gary on mute. Do it. You got to have a question. We, we wanted to know if Brooke was married. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I am married. Which is why you're one name on your Zoom and another name on the invite, young lady. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Bob Yak is my maiden name. Um, yeah. Got married. Uh, 
actually, it's so funny. People ask me that. I'm like, when did I get married? I was, so I was engaged in 2019 and we were set to get married in 2020, but then that rolled down a few years. So I got married a couple of years ago. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, lucky man, keep him on track. You know what I mean? Just let him know you got a fan club in case he ever gets out of line. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Questions, comments, concerns, fires. food related or otherwise? <laughs> were, were you affected by the fires? Oh, by the fires. Yeah, the fires in 2020. Um, yeah, so the the fires came pretty close to us. Um, I mean, obviously, it's just like always a little alarming when that comes out of nowhere. Uh, but we were fine. Like um, all our winery was totally fine and unaffected and our vineyards um uh well actually i mean our we were i mean so i was not at bell union in 2020 i was at nickel and nickel right so um i was helping put together those wines right but bell union interesting enough did not make a 2020 um napa cab and the reason for that is um you know if there's any kind of doubt or anything, um, then we just like, we won't put it into bottle. And so um, I was lucky that when we were working at Nickel and Nickel at the time that um, we were able to, you know, still make our, our single vineyard wine. Um, so yeah, we just went straight to 2020, 2021, which is the, the vineyard that, or the vintage that I was in charge of, of making and, um, that was a beautiful year and then so so was last year last year was great 2022 so we're making I, a strong um, comeback for sure we're making a really strong comeback exactly all right Tom, uh, Marty, hit, hit me uh, Garrett, and then we'll go to the court all right here we go hit me Garrett. <laughs> 2024 june I'm going to no, Brooke, just lock it up. Uh, I'm going to bring a large loud crew that you will definitely be able to hear while we're there so come say hi <laughs> <laughs> Corey, yes. hi I, am i allowed to ask a question now He's you're so allowed to just none of that nonsense no, you muted yourself again <laughs> grin did uh, yeah i'm actually the one that went to michigan not brad so oh my goodness I have no uh, so many angry gestures but all right so just this once i was just curious if um in 2020 any of the red grapes you were able to repurpose into rosé or, or do you that, have anything else with it um, rather than just get rid of it? No, that's a good question because we um, we didn't start making rosé um, as a winery until 2021. Um, we, for the longest time, people had been asking, but en route, really an, up until then, was the only winery that was making rosé. But like with anything, if there's enough interest and if the people want it, then we'll make it. So um, we made our first rosé in 2021. Awesome. And tell them like, it's a pretty unique rosé. It is made from a grape that you don't see a lot of rosés coming out, but it's super yeah. good. Yeah, exactly. So it's, um, it's primarily a rosé of Malbec and um, that's, 100% uh, Malbec in the 2021 vintage. In 2022, which we're bottling next week, it is primarily Malbec. And this year we were able to get our hands on some um, some Saunier of uh, Cabernet Franc. And that's that's really how we make our rosé. So it's like, it's extra, um, it, it's just a nice little added bonus Saunier that um, comes from the Malbec um, and Cab Franc, and um, we end up putting it into bottle, and it makes just like a really nice, like fresh, crisp, um, beautiful uh, rosé. So there's not much of it, though. I will have to say it's very limited quantity, so um, it's just a nice little added bonus that we do, but it's it's very small. And I would say, honestly, if there are any rosé fans, um, our company, as a company, like Brooke mentioned, we produce a rosé of Pinot over at En Route, mm -hmm. and then we're doing the rosé of mostly Malbec. If you're at all a rosé fan, get a bottle of each and do them side by side, because they're both phenomenal wines, but they're so flavor profile and structurally that different that it's really cool. I mean, I, I, I'm going to show my Midwest, but in the best way possible. I have definitely described Brooks Rosé as cookout wine. 
because I love it's like I love rosé, but like as soon as you introduce food, it tastes like nothing. And I love that that rosé of Malbec has enough structure to it that even if you're eating, you can still enjoy that rosé. Like I just I, I think it's a really well made wine. So credit where credits do, but I just let my Ohio hang out a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you said can't wait until rosé season. Same. Yeah, love rosé season. <laughs> I'll say rosé all day. I love it. So it's it's fun. Lauren, I'm glad you like it. Say hi to Renee for me because she said she never gets acknowledged. So I love Renee. <laughs> um, anybody else? Mike, you unmuted. And um, well, it'll be his wife, me. but similarly, uh, his wife is talking instead. But um, okay. you had mentioned this was the first time doing the the Sauvignon Blanc but you were utilizing uh, the estate's grapes. Was this the first time the grapes were ready to be utilized or were you selling them off to other vineyards prior to that? Sorry, well, sorry what's it the question? It was about the Sauvignon Blanc. Like, have we, when you started making the Sauvignon Blanc in 2021, had we always had access to those Sauvignon Blanc grapes and we were just selling them off or that was the first chance you got to source Sauvignon Blanc grapes to make an SB? So that was, yeah, that was our first chance we got to source from the estate, from Bella Union Estate. So, um, but it wasn't particularly, it wasn't exactly our first year making Sauv Blanc. Um, I want to say it was 2019 that we first make, made Sauv Blanc. And then at that point, um, it was only sourced from the DeCarly Vineyard. So, yeah. And so now, now that we own, you know, our new home and then the, uh, existing vineyards surrounding the Bella Union Estate that unlocked uh, access to more fruit um, out of our Bella Union Estate. So I'm super excited about the quality that comes out of the estate. And I will have to say something that I forgot to mention about it um, that is different is that on the estate, it's not only um, Sauvignon Blanc that's planted, but there's a small little parcel of Semillon and uh, that adds some really nice complexity to the wine too. Semillon, like the Sauvignon Blanc will bring like all the beautiful aromatics and then the Semillon will bring some really nice like texture to it as well. So um, it's like so nice to be able to play with all those different varieties. Um, so yeah, it's, I feel like our Sauvignon Blanc is only getting better and better, so. Look, Brooke, we had a question I saw come through the chat about barrels, like French oak, like, is it one of those where like we all use French oak barrels because you know like wine from French, French oak, like what is so special about French oak barrels? Is anybody using non-French oak barrels? Like talk a little bit about barrels because everybody always talks about, oh, you can taste the oak and we're aging it in oak, but why? Like what, what, why do we use French oak and why do we even age it? Like, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, that's such a good question, right? Like, um, cause we like what the, <clears throat> what the barrel does bring to the wine right um and the french oak uh basically like i mean i could i could go into this in, in great depth about like the different sourcing of different forests within france um but yeah i mean even just like within the different forests in france like kind of near burgundy and bordeaux even central like central france um where the like the actual the oak that like the trees that are grown there um and you know like cut down and turned into barrels and whatnot um are like they bring things like characteristically very different than like american oak um okay. porosity of like the actual like wood itself like the is grain different of the wood. yeah the grain okay. like the tightness of the grain varies um the different like flavors uh flavor profiles that um that come from oak itself are very different as well um american oak tends to be a little bit more like flashy there's uh, a lot of people describe it as being like a little bit more dill whereas uh, french oak uh, really kind of brings more like um kind of uh, vanilla um uh, vanilla toasted almond um, that kind of thing, just like more delicate, toasty aromas um, than forests from like different parts of the world as well. Um, and it really kind of, it comes down to the type of wine that you're making, right? So um, like 
bigger, bolder wines can handle more oak because they, they are more tannic and, and big and bold and expressive. But if you were to have a, like a lighter style wine, um, I mean, an, ex an extreme example would be like Pinot Noir, for example. You don't want to put that in like tons of super toasty, flashy oak. Um, if, it, if it is a lighter style Pinot, because uh, it won't necessarily hold up as well as like a like a heavier, um, more tannic wine. So. And so does that also kind of lend itself to, like we talked about how Joe on the nickel and nickels used like 50% brand new, 50% neutral. Yeah. It, it, like, is there that the reasoning behind it is like the newer oak tends to give a little bit more aggressive oaking, whereas the neutral is a little bit more subtle or what like? Yeah, exactly. So like we refer to neutral as just kind of a blanket term as like it's been used more than one time. Um, and like, so you have your like your once year or one time used uh, oak and then like twice in three years used. Um, and really after like it's already been used uh, once, it doesn't impart any oak at that point. Um, which which is interesting, which is why we continue to buy and purchase oak every year because it won't um, contribute its you know beautiful uh, toastiness and all the all the kind of magic that it imparts uh, after um, it, it'll create its, it's, its more largest used, it's impact. It's like an aging vessel as opposed to actually trying to impart more flavor at that point. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then there's like I mean uh, another aspect is like um, I mean you could ask you like why barrel versus stainless steel, it really comes down to like, um, again, we were, we were talking about like the porosity, there's like a, a kind of a, an oxygen ingress and oxygen exchange um, that that is occurring naturally in the barrel too, which like helps it age in like in oak and, um, you know, during its 18 months gracefully. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it really just kind of comes down to, to that as well. So. Well, um, anybody else? Cause we, we've gone a little bit over time, but I don't want to miss out on anybody questions. Anybody else have a question for Brooke? All right. Well, I'll tell you what, um, don't worry about it. If one comes up later, you have my contact information, please do. But I do want to let everybody know next week, you are going to get two things from us. One, you are going to get an email with a recording of tonight's, we'll say performance, but um, you will get a recording of tonight's tasting. Plus next week, you will also get the information on the wines that we're going to do next week. Um, we are very much looking forward to having you all on next week, next month, tell your friends. So next week you will get your recording. You will get the wines for next time. And uh, obviously, like we talked about, everybody's going to need to pick up a case of all of these. Um, we want to make it easy for you. So when you check out on the Farniente website, use the code HOSTED, H-O-S-T-E-D, and you will get 20% off whenever you want to go ahead and place your order to be able to replenish. Um, I will say huge thank you to Brooke. Um, with it being a focus on women and wine, like I, it is really cool for everybody to get to know you. And I appreciate you taking some time out of your day. Um, everybody else, thank you so much for spending some of your evening with us. Um, please feel free to give us your feedback. I know we went to a little bit earlier start time so we can get the East Coast people before bed, but um, we would love to hear from all of you and I can't wait to see you all next week. Uh, next week, next month. I'm so excited. I want to do Hosted at Home again next week, but um, we will see you all for Hosted at Home in April. Thank you all very much. Thank you to Brooke. Thank you to everybody on this call. I'm Todd Elliott and I can't wait to see you all next month. Bye, everybody. Cheers.